Good evening. Good evening, colleagues, alumni, students, members of the press, and friends. Welcome to this evening's conversation. And it will be an extraordinary conversation. We're delighted to mark the publication of Volker, The Triumph of Persistence, a biography written by our esteemed colleague, Professor William Silber. We're privileged to welcome back to Stern, Mr. Paul Volker, Chairman Volker, a man widely admired as a dedicated public servant, indeed both a national and international treasure. As Under Secretary of the Treasury for Monetary Affairs, Mr. Volker played a key role in resolving the crisis of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. During his tenure as Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Chairman Volker tamed double-digit inflation in the United States. In doing so, he reestablished the credibility of U.S. monetary policy and laid the foundation for a generation of economic prosperity, both at home and abroad. Most recently, in the wake of the recent financial crisis, Mr. Volcker resumed his position as a policy leader, promoting reforms such as the Volcker Rule to restore financial stability and to bring the incentives for risk-taking by individual financial institutions in line with the public good. Tonight, we're also privileged to have with us the man who can tell Volcker's important story like no other. Bill Silber is the Marcus Nadler Professor of Finance and Economics and Director of the Glucksman Institute for Research in Securities Markets here at the Stern School of Business. His biography of Mr. Volcker has received critical acclaim from Bloomberg, Business Week, The Economist, The Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. And the list goes on. I don't have time to read the entire list of critical acclaim that's, uh, that's, that's lauding uh, Bill's book. The book is also shortlisted by the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs for Business Book of the Year. Professor Silber is not only an expert on financial markets and monetary economics, he's also a master teacher, one of the real greats. As his former students, many of whom are here tonight in the audience, can attest, Bill can communicate a complex economic and political story in a way his audience will never forget. And finally, I'm delighted to introduce Francesco Guerrera, the money and investing editor of the Wall Street Journal, who will moderate tonight's discussion about the lessons from Paul's life in economic policy. And as I prepare to turn the, the podium over to Bill uh, for his opening remarks, let me just finally say thank you to the Development and Alumni Relations Office uh, and the Stern Center for Global Business, global, the Global Economy and Business, and Director Kim Schoenholtz for organizing tonight's conversation. Again, we look forward to all that is going to be said here this evening. I welcome to the podium none other than Bill Silber. Thank you, Peter. That was very nice. You, you didn't tell me that there were so many people here. So I have a sneaky suspicion that you're not uh, here just to listen to me. So I'm going to be very brief, 13 minutes on a 300-page book. And I'm going to give you some background, and I'm going to give you some substance. The background starts with the title of the book. The title of the book is the first thing you see, but it's the last thing that we do. And when we put our heads together at Bloomsbury Press to create a title for this book, we thought about a number of alternatives to the one that you see in a shameless attempt to capitalize on the notoriety of the Volcker rule among commercial bankers, I tried the semi-biblical Volcker, know thy enemy. <laughs> now, that was rejected as too narrow. I mean, how many commercial bankers are there? Fewer than before, we know that. Uh, someone else suggested a much more expansive Volcker rules. <laughs> and now, that was cute. And the fellow on my left, the tall one, he loved it. <laughs> but it was knocked out because as the poet says, too cute ain't cute. So instead, we took the title, The Triumph of Persistence. And that's because that describes how Paul Volcker did what he did. 
In researching this book, I had access to both the personal and the professional sides of Paul Volcker. He dumped into my lap the entire contents of a walk-in closet in his apartment, <laughs> including the elementary school report cards that had been carefully preserved by his mother, Alma Volker. He also authorized my reviewing uh, his extensive Fed correspondence held in the archives of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The Fed did not like that one bit. Federal Reserve makes the CIA look like publicity hounds. And finally, he sat for over 100 hours of interviews with me, and I'm sure you can guess it was not always happily. So now let me turn to some substance. This book is really two stories in one. It's a story about a man who served under five presidents battling the three greatest financial crises of the last half century. But it's really a story about trust. And what I'm going to do is first tell you a little bit about the crises and then go to the underlying theme. Crisis number one is gold. On August 15th, 1971, some of you may remember that President Nixon severed the final link between the dollar and gold by suspending foreign central banks' rights to exchange dollars for gold, which they could have done until now. Contrary to popular belief, this was Paul Volcker's idea. He was the undersecretary of uh, the Treasury for the Monetary Affairs at the time, and he calls this particular incident the single most significant event of his career. Crisis number two, of course, is inflation. When the annual rate of inflation hit double digits, in the first half of 1979, President Jimmy Carter appointed him chairman of the Federal Reserve Board over the strenuous objections of his advisors, who said that he was too independent and outspoken. I wonder where they got that idea from. Two months later, Paul Volcker raised interest, changed the operating techniques of the Federal Reserve, raised interest rates to higher levels than the chairman himself thought. 15% on long-term U.S. Treasury securities, 20% on commercial loans to commercial banks, prime commercial banks, prime loans. Both are modern records that still stand. And crisis number three is, of course, the world financial crisis that began in 2007 and is still with us. Let me just say that the Volcker Rule label was announced by the to the press by President Obama in January of 2010, caught Paul Volcker by surprise. Not the rule, but the label. In fact, when he heard the president announce his name, he thought to himself, now why did he do that? And that's why I say my favorite phrase in this book describing Paul Volcker is the man who could find fault with the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Paul Volcker made a living saying no. He said no to gold in 1971. He said no to inflation in 1979. And he said no to commercial bank speculation in 2010. But the underlying theme, the underlying storyline is trust, which, by the way, is the title of the last chapter of this book. It is six pages. You can go directly there, and you can skip all the stories if you want. When President Obama appointed him chairman of the President's Economic Recovery Advisory Board, PRAD, Carlo Ciampi, the former president of Italy, wrote Paul Volcker a three-word letter. That letter still sits in a chrome frame on his desk. It says... We trust you. And in this book, I show how Paul Volcker earned that trust and follow up with the lessons. And I'm going to start at the beginning. Paul Volcker learned about trust as a child. His father, Paul Volcker Sr., was the town manager of Teaneck, New Jersey from 1930 to 1950. And he had a quotation from George Washington hanging in a frame behind his desk. It's an obscure quote from a letter George Washington wrote to his officers, who at the time were getting applications from other people to be officers. And the quote says, do not suffer your good nature to say yes 
when you ought to say no, remember that it is a public and not a private cause that will be injured or benefited by your choice. That quote worked its way into Paul Volcker's brain, and he's been saying no ever since. <laughs> Paul Volcker is known today for the Volcker Room, but he earned the trust that's synonymous with his name by standing up to the political pressure during the 1980s and defeating an inflation that almost destroyed the American financial system. Why is he obsessed with inflation? He is fond of blaming his mother, just like the rest of us, for all of our obsessions. And I, says he have to, I say he has to stand in line for that. He's upset, he was upset, because she refused to give him an increase in his allowance. At the end of World War II in 1945, when he was leaving to go to Princeton to reflect the inflation of World War II. But in point of fact, the real reason he is obsessed with inflation is that he is obsessed with the honor of government service, perhaps because of his father. He believes that inflation undermines trust in government. The trust that the government will not abuse the right that we as citizens give the government to print money. I must tell you, this is a unique, overlooked, but perhaps the most fundamental reason for the evils of inflation. I'd never heard it before, and I've been studying inflation since I've been seven. Trust, in fact, brings me to the lessons of the book today. Americans have enjoyed the benefits of consuming more than we produce because the world uses the dollar as international money. People talk about reserves. It's international money. And there are many reasons for the dollar's supremacy, but the most fundamental is that investors trust us not to debase the currency by inflating. And that trust will be sorely tested going forward unless we get the long-term full employment budget under control. Now, I show in this book that Paul Volcker ultimately controlled inflation by refusing to monetize the Reagan-era budget deficits. The process began before, in October of 1979, when he changed the monetary procedures at the Federal Reserve, drove down inflation from 12% to 4% within three years. By 1982, inflation was down to 4%. But the final victory, certainly for interest rates, came only after Congress passed a balanced budget amendment in 1985. It was called the graham rudman Hollings bill that imposed draconian cuts in government spending unless the government, unless Congress passed a balanced budget. Does that sound familiar? It's almost like what we have now. Senator Warren Rudman, one of the sponsors of the bill, said it was a bad idea whose time had come. And yet, only after Graham Rudman Hollings was passed did long term interest rates decline below the 10% level that they had remained above throughout Paul Volcker's first six years at the head of the central bank. What triggered this unprecedented legislation? More than a year before Graham Rudman Hollings was passed, Senator John Hines, the late Senator John Hines, who was killed in an airplane crash a few years ago, uncovered a hidden agenda in Paul Volcker's plan during Senate Banking Committee hearings. This is so important, I'm going to reenact the conversation. <laughs> Ready? Hines says, Mr. Chairman, we've agreed that the deficit is bad. But if my experience in Congress is anything to go by, there's going to have to be a crisis in order to fix it. And my question is, are you prepared to bring about the necessary crisis through your continued restrictive monetary policy? Paul Volcker could hardly believe his ears. I mean, what is this? To avoid 
a political suicide by the Fed, he answers. Now, I'm not going to try to do him. He can imitate himself better than I can. So all I'm going to say is, as a matter of general, this is what he says, as a matter of general philosophical approach, and I feel very strongly about this, it's not our job to artificially provoke a crisis. So Heinz appears to back off and he says, Mr. Chairman, I never intimated that that, in fact, was what was part of your thinking. And Paul Volcker deadpans, well, I wasn't absolutely positively sure about that. And then Heinz comes back and says, but it might be an inevitable consequence of your tight monetary policy. Paul Volcker, like George Washington, can't tell a lie. And he says, all right. And the all right response, in fact, confirmed the hidden agenda. What was the hidden agenda? To maintain painfully high interest rates, to convince Congress to curtail the budget deficit so that monetary policy could eventually ease up. The day after the bill, just a final confirmation, the day after the bill was passed, Senator Phil Graham, who was the architect of the balanced budget amendment, called Paul Volcker and says, OK, now that we have the budget under control, do you think we can have an easier monetary policy? And Volcker answers, we'll see. Now that's a typical central banker's response. And that brings me, of course, to today and the immediate future. The current full employment budget deficit is about 5% of GNP, 5% of national economic activity. It's a number that is eerily similar to the Reagan era budget deficits. And Ben Bernanke is going to need lots of help in engineering and economic recovery without inflation. The Volcker Fed raised interest rates after years of inflation had garnered public support for tight monetary policy. But right now, after years of recession and unemployment, the Federal Reserve may encounter lots of resistance if it has to act preemptively, which is the only way it can do it. And it is therefore crucial that Congress and the President embark on a plan to balance the full employment budget, as it did in the late 1980s and in the 1990s. Only then can we really trust that the Federal Reserve will act irresponsibly. I'm sorry to end on such a sad note, but that's it. Francesco, it's up to you to rescue us with some, with some optimism. No pressure. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You ready? Sounds like a good book. It sounds like a good book, doesn't it? <laughs> it, it, is, it is a good book. I read it twice, and uh, I can tell you it's a good book. If, if Bill thinks, suspects that you're not here to hear just from him, I am positive that you're not here to hear from me. So I will tell you just a couple of things, and then we'll go straight into the discussion. The, uh, the book is terrific for two reasons. One is Paul Vogt is a terrific subject, an historic figure that has uh, straddled the global financial stage for more than 40 years. And also it's a terrific book because, and take it from my writer, William Silver is a terrific writer. He's concise, witty, uh, very, very, a very breezy writer. Uh, I read uh, Busan's books for a living and it's tough. This is not tough. <laughs> so, so with that said, we're gonna have a half an hour conversation among ourselves and then we wanna hear from you. So the way we're gonna do this is there are gonna be people going up and down the aisles only twice uh, and you have to hand over your question cards to them. I will, will then select them and read some and get Mr. Volker and Professor Silver to respond to those. So be careful, the people on the aisles, you only get two chances. So, uh, and uh, with, without further ado, I would like to start, um, and I'll address the question to both of you, and then we'll see. Reading the book, the question in the mind of any contemporary reader will be, are there any lessons from the Volcker eras, I say eras, not era, for the, in the present situation. Today, uh, we're fighting clearly a different evil. We're fighting unemployment and not inflation, at least at the moment. Yet we're having some of the same condition, a huge budget deficit that we need to solve. Is the solution higher interest rates? 
Well, let me answer the question. Let me say, first of all, how happy I am that I'm old enough to have read this book. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, after the 80s, it wasn't just a phenomenon in the United States, but inflation had gotten very high around the, the world, but particularly in the United States, with our responsibilities for a world currency. And people rather thought this was a problem that couldn't be dealt with. But by the end of the decade, they thought it had, could be dealt with. And central banking became popular at the time because central banks were going to be the guardian of price stability. Now, that's 20 years ago. But there was this glorious period of central banking. Now we face this huge financial crisis, very big recession, lingering recession. So all the emphasis is on expansion. There's no inflation at the moment with all that's going on. But it does raise the question whether in this necessary, understandable wish to push money out into the system and get the economy going again, will we lose sight of the lesson that we learned with some difficulty in the 70s and 1980s? So I hope not. But I am uh, very glad when I hear the Federal Reserve saying, as they say repeatedly, they're taking more and more action for easier money. But they always stick on the end of their statements. But we, we want to do it all in the context of price stability. And I'm glad to hear them kind of repeat that, that mantra and hope that it will be acted upon when the time comes to act, which isn't right now. You mentioned in your opening statement that the Fed has to act necessarily preemptively if it's going to work. So when will that be the time to act? So I'm not sure that anybody should take from what I said that the Fed should tighten now. I didn't say that, uh, and I don't think they should unless the unemployment rate starts to really come down even faster than it already seems to be coming down. Uh, but I think you have to worry about price stability. Price stability is easy to say and hard to do, like diet and exercise. They're easy <laughs> to say and hard to do. And one of the things that Paul Volcker taught us is that the big mistake that was made in the 70s and not in the 80s, in the 70s was remaining too easy for too long. Mm -hmm. And he was criticized in, not in 1980, not so much in 82, in 1985 when the unemployment rate was 7.5% and the Fed tightened up because it was being preemptive. I worry whether Ben Bernanke or whoever follows him will in fact be able to preemptively raise rates when we have a legacy of five years of unemployment. The Fed is independent, but not independent of Congress. And in this context, one of the, I guess one of the threads of the book, uh, which should have been called really Volcker Rules, I would, I would have voted for that because it shows... <laughs> he wanted to pay extra for Volcker Rules. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it would have been money well spent. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think, I think one of the threads is really, it, show, it shows the, the, the power of central banks when properly used uh, to influence uh, economic activity. I guess the question facing a lot of central banks today, which I'm sure you faced throughout your career, is have the central banks done too much to compensate for a political arena where nothing or very little has been done on the fiscal front? I don't know whether they've done too much three years from now. <laughs> I don't think we can tell right, right now. We are in a in a situation we haven't faced since the 1930s. And the lesson that was driven home to many economists who grew up in the post-World War II world was that a great mistake was made in the 1930s with a long recession and long unemployment that the Federal Reserve gave up. Well, they were, they were too late to ease and uh, too early to tighten. Under those particular circumstances, now, I hope that lesson isn't so embedded that they forget to tighten in time when that will inevitably come down the road. But it's not, it's not here right now. And you can argue about these recent moves. I, I do think the, you know, the traditional powers of the Federal Reserve have been to a considerable degree exhausted 
They may have one or two little things left in the toolbox, but nothing that's very dramatic. So here we are. We have to rely upon other policy measures. Got to rely upon a little return and a so-called animal spirit sometime to get the economy going again. But we are in a situation we haven't been in since the 1930s of a great financial expansion in the late 1920s and here in the early part of this century, and a great bust not in the stock market, now in the housing market. It's happened in Japan where they had a bust both in the stock market and in the housing market, and they still haven't recovered mm -hmm. fully. And we got Europe where they had their own excesses. And the real lesson here is not so much inflation at the moment, but how do we ever let these excesses of housing here, housing in Spain, mm -hmm. housing elsewhere in, in Ireland, in Japan earlier, how they got their excess. Remember those days when you used to talk about the property around the Imperial Palace in Tokyo? Mm -hmm. yes. and a few hundred acres was equal to the value of all the real estate in California. Yeah. Now that was real, I don't know if it was true, but even to talk about it, it was a sense of how extreme these right. excesses have gotten. But do you Japan share the, that. when you talk to, to Fed officials, uh, off the record, do you, you share... I'm off the record here. No, not now. No, <laughs> no, no. no. You're, you're fully mic'd. Um, <laughs> you, uh, when, when I talk to a Fed official off the record, hence the parallel oh, with the CIA, the, yeah. Bill Silberman, um, they... they reveal and, and betray a certain kind of frustration with the criticism they've been subjected, including the criticism that they're easing to too much, because they say, well, there was the only course of action. We couldn't have done anything else in the face of a political um, class that wasn't doing much or anything at all on the fiscal front. Do you, do you share that? Well, they got it in both directions, and I, you know, I don't think you should just act because you're getting a lot of criticism and people are impatient. But if you really think you can accomplish something, you, you act. Now, they got a lot of criticism, just happened to be in the paper the last few days, from, from so-called emerging countries, that somehow the easing measures that the Federal Reserve is taking is somehow undermining unfairly and unreasonably prospects for the developing world. Uh, we have a responsibility for importing for them uh, that somehow we are hampering. And that, that criticism just seems to me... Uh, I don't understand it. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild, pretty wild that somehow we should tighten up in the United States to help Brazil. Right. Uh, it's a little far-fetched in terms of the, the cause and effect, and I agree with what I guess uh, Chairman Bernanke was saying the other day, that uh, what he's doing is not aimed at emerging countries, right. as some of them are saying, not aimed at them at all. It's aimed for policies to create a recovery in the United States, hopefully, which in the long run will help everybody. Yeah. Now he's got to do that consistent with stability in the dollar, and that's the that's the tricky part. You know, believe it or not, he sounds too nice. You see, <laughs> I mean, he doesn't want to criticize Ben Bernanke. But oh, I'm really eager to secretly, but I just think yeah. uh, it's on <laughs> he, He's really a nice guy, despite all the press. And. Uh, <laughs> What I think is important. This guy is, wrote a book. Or? He did. <laughs> More than one. I'm starting the second book right now. <laughs> so I want to uh, buy the first one. Then. <laughs> so uh, it's not. You know, we talk about we should have had fiscal stimulus, and we should have had fiscal stimulus. You need unemployment insurance because you need to bolster spending, but you also need long-term budget balance. If there is one lesson that comes out of the 1980s is that you can't have responsible monetary policy without responsible fiscal policy. It's too hard. Politically, it's too hard. This is not a question of can you control the money supply. You can control the money supply, but can you take the heat that Congress will in fact Call, call the chairman and say, what are you raising interest rates now? We just had unemployment. You're trying to nip the recovery in, in the bud. And, you know, this is, uh, when, you, when it comes to inflation, and he knows this better than I do, 
You can't wait until you see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> it doesn't work. You have to nip inflation beforehand. And I'm afraid that when Ben Bernanke says, well, there's no other game in town because fiscal stimulus is not there, I'm going to push out the money supply. Don't worry. We'll take care of it later. I say, again, that's easy to say and very, very hard to do. It's going to be very difficult for Ben Bernanke or whoever is the Fed chairman if it's a problem. It's not a problem right now. 12 months from now or 18 months from now, you get a recovery going with a kind of deficit that we have outstanding and with the kind of liquidity that's sitting in the banking system. I want to see a Fed chairman then raise interest rates. And I'm not talking about, oh, yeah, we'll go from 1.6 on the long-term bond to 2.1. How about from 1.6 to 4? Because you're not going to get anybody's attention in any other way. And that is really a, it's a political problem. This is not an economic problem. This is a political problem. And the two issues, monetary policy and fiscal policy, can't be separated. That's what he told Senator Hines. Shall we put Silver in office? <laughs> <laughs> No, well, there you go. <laughs> Why do you think I wrote this book? <laughs> so it's a start of his political campaign. Well, it's a start of his political campaign. So yes, but, uh, um, I mean, he hadn't told me about that before. But this is the hidden agenda. And so, you, are, you ready, are you ready to be the chairman again? No, 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 I'm sitting here. I'm a little old for that, but oh, no. you're a young man, rigorous. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. But on the other hand, what you're pinpointing and what you see throughout the book, it's, that's a structural problem. That, that the issue that you just raised is a structural problem. It always happens. It's, no, it's very difficult to find the time when fiscal no, policy. It's very difficult to, to be, I don't know, balanced or something. It's equally difficult to get the fiscal side in shape. Right. And that's, of course, everybody's talking about. And whether we really do it, nobody's talking about really making a substantial tightening the fiscal policy immediately. But they're all talking about how much has to be done, you know, in the Never Never Land in the future. Never Never Land is a year or two off. And uh, this is the, obviously the big test for any new administration. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about that, because in, in journalistic terms, the big reveal of the book, the really surprising thing is, is, is your finding that uh, the policy of high interest rate effectively strong armed the White House into uh, a responsible fiscal policy, I, I paraphrase. But first of all, I want to ask Mr. Volk if that's his recollection, if that was the agenda, if that's what he wanted to do. Uh, you know, the idea that I sat here thinking I was strong arming anybody it was uh, it's not the way I saw it. I, you, know, you did what you thought was necessary and appropriate under the circumstances. And once you got underway at this policy, you weren't going to give up in a hurry. <laughs> so you kept at it. Um, I can't say as I had any uh, great faith that the Congress was going to act decisively to right. deal with the budget. So you just proceeded along as you thought you had to do it. But I'm, just, I'm going to jump in. Of course. Because let me just tell you, when I started to write this book, this wasn't even on the agenda. <laughs> it was not something that was part of this book because I didn't know about it. The only way I found out about it is by reading the documents, the contemporary documents, by reading the interchange between him and Senator Hines. You say, well, that was public. That was sort of for public consumption. You then read the minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee. And one of the people on the Federal Open Market Committee is a fellow by the name of Jerry Corrigan, who was a protege of Paul Volcker. And he said, if we don't raise interest rates, the chances of getting any help from the fiscal side is almost zero. So I got to say that if you read what the Federal Reserve System was saying behind closed doors, and by the way, back then, nobody expected the minutes to be public because they weren't public until 1993. So this was really unfiltered conversation. And they were very clear. It was conversation. 
Yeah, and what do you want me to rely on? <laughs> Just what I remember back then. Conversation that was going on. We had this argument in all these hours that we talked together. I said, this is the way it was, Bill. He said, no, I found this quotation someplace. And it, you know, that's contemporary record. We have to go with the contemporary record. And he said, Bill, you don't know the context in which that guy was talking. He was saying the opposite of what he really meant. I know that. Just <laughs> Do you want me to say what he reminded? He he reminded me, by the way, after the book. He didn't read the book until it was already went to press. He calls me up afterwards and said, "You made a big mistake." <laughs> this is the truth. He calls me up. You made a big mistake. I said, "What was the big mistake?" He says, "You got my resignation wrong." I said, your resignation wrong? I mean, that was very important because I have this whole story about what happened to foreign exchange. Foreign exchange collapsed and gold went up when he, the day he resigned. You got it all wrong. I said, what do you mean I got it all wrong? He says, I resigned Monday afternoon. You say I resigned Tuesday morning. <laughs> God. So I was sweating, I got to tell you. The book was already out. It was too late, Peter. It was gone, you know? So... What happened is, I said, well, let me check. So I go and I look at President Reagan's diaries. <laughs> President Reagan's diaries, that's not such a bad, that's not such a bad source to look at. And of course, President Reagan says. He wasn't the most reliable. <laughs> <guy>. <laughs> But this was his diary. And in the diary, it says, guess what? We have a, we're going to have the announcement Tuesday morning. I call him back. I said, well, yeah, maybe that was one thing that I forgot about. <laughs> so I think contemporary records have their place. <laughs> but I think maybe I'm hopeful that we can resolve this discussion you've had over 100 hours in the next two minutes. So, so I'm hopeful. Um, so are you saying that that, what happened, so the, the fiscal responsibility that the um, US government eventually embraced was just an unintended consequence, to coin a phrase, of your policy? Is that, well, the, that I, wasn't intended? Know, this is a long time ago, and I don't remember it all. <laughs> I, mean, I can give a nice glossy explanation that you can't refute, because who knows what I was thinking at that point. But <laughs> my memory is, you know, we were carrying on a pretty tight policy. Uh, at a time when the economy was recovering by that time, but it was a still high yeah. unemployment. Uh, and I didn't have any great faith that the Congress was going to act. But uh, I think the fact that interest rates were so high probably was a factor in them getting together and finally taking this Graham Rudman thing for what it how, how effective that was is another question. It was effective for a very short period, or a reasonably short period. But right. I, I think, right. yeah, the high interest rates probably had something to do with it. Uh, but it wasn't a direct you know, a plot on my part. That's, it would have been suicidal if you... <laughs> right. Um, that's as much consensus as we're going to get on that. And I think, I feel... Let, let's move... To the, the, the... It sounded like we agreed perfectly. I yes, think. yes. <laughs> sure. Um, the... So let's talk about the Volcker rule before we move on to the questions from the audience. Um, it, you're not going to get many Christmas cards for bank, from bankers on this. Let's just, let's just face it. But you it, would be surprised at the number of bankers that agree with me. Now, there's some very important ones that yeah. don't. But publicly, not many, though, no? Well, you know, uh, publicly occasionally, yes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I saw one very prominent banker the other day quoted as saying a philosophy. Philosophically, I agree with Volker. Right. Uh, most of them are retired, though. Most <laughs> retired ones <laughs> <don't> agree <laughs> with him, for sure. Or about to retire after they agree with him. So um, I, I want to ask you. I want to ask you this because one of the uh, the things you hear from the financial services industry when they talk about the rule is, it's got nothing to do with the crisis. It had nothing to do with the crisis uh, for private trade. Uh, <laughs> but you've heard you that before. You want um, to so. What's your answer to that? Well, the answer is, of course, that's wrong. <laughs> right. That's a good answer. Uh, I mean, you just look at the whole outcome of the crisis. Uh, there were a lot of, well, from one point of view, I've been told, I haven't done the figuring myself, that the banks lost as much money on trading in 2008 than they gained 
than they'd earned in the previous four or five years. And that that had nothing to do with the crisis. It's just not reasonable. But you know all the individual cases of during this period of crisis where losses of five, ten million dollars uh, arose from individual traders, forget about the, which were unsettling. But the important thing about this for me, which is overlooked, is not just the risk involved in the trading, which is real, but has this trading mentality, which is a phenomenon of the last 15 or so years, and all the financial engineering and so forth, did that affect the culture of banking generally so that it led to behavior patterns that were simply inconsistent with stability? Now, the biggest single factor in this balloon, of course, was housing here. But how did you have all these subprime mortgages easily sold, people manipulating them, selling them? This is kind of trading in itself. But this is you know, it's partly a reflection of compensation practices. How can we get in on the deals that the traders are making? So people out there making mortgages are supposed to be the most conservative commercial bankers in the world. They suddenly became the highest, mm -hmm. the highest riders and threw it all off. Then, then why not just cut out the middleman and split the banks? Yeah, well, they they use these fancy techniques to, to uh, uh, securitize it all. They used brokers who, you know, made a hundred or two hundred dollars every time they put together a lousy uh, mortgage. But I have never argued that the risks of proprietary trading in itself was the sure. cause of all the crisis. But did it contribute to the cultural atmosphere that, in fact, was the cause of the crisis? Biggest problem the banks made is they made too many bad loans on real estate. It wasn't just banks, but others. There's no question about that, but what is a, it was a major factor. But what contributed to that mm -hmm. uh, kind of behavior? And why not then call for international glass steagall Just completely ban the banks, the commercial banks, from doing uh, trading activities or speculation. Why not just do that? Well, you could, and, uh, and I, I didn't think that was the way to go, but that is, you know, when you look at the so-called Vickers report in the UK, and now a new report by the uh, European Commission, mm -hmm. or to the European Commission, they propose something that smells like a <laughs> steagall with a, with a difference. They say, let's separate all those activities. The same, same thing I'm doing, you use the same language about proprietary activity and trading and all the rest. And they say, but let's keep it in the same holding company. We'll permit them to keep it in the same holding company, but we'll separate the banking subsidiary from the investment banking subsidiary, and we'll put all the trading, more than I would, uh, in this subsidiary, all the underwriting, all the lending, all the prime brokerage, all the lending to hedge mm -hmm. funds and equity funds. We'll sequester them in a separate subsidiary, and we'll have this other subsidiary that's a pristine commercial bank. Now, when I see that, I wonder, why didn't they take the final step and say, mm -hmm. stick it in a separate subsidiary? Right. Just say, no, that's got to be a separate company. Right. Because it's very hard to take two subsidiaries of the same company and say that they're not related and mm -hmm. interdependent. And they immediately run into problems. I run into problems. How do you define proprietary trading? They run into problems. Which transactions will we permit between the the so-called investment bank and the retail bank, and you know, right. immediately the banks say you've got to permit more and more. Uh, so you know, you've got a choice, but we're both looking at the same problem. They use the same language mm -hmm. when they discuss it as to what it does to the environment, what risk does it create, what's it doing to the culture. So let's separate them all. Mm -hmm. In a way, they're more draconian than I am. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Um, Bill, you are one of the leading experts on the Walker Rule, because you told me, and, uh, <laughs> and, we, and we discussed it. Um, you wrote a very nice article about I it. I did, yeah, and I yes. could. So, um, I liked it. Yeah, could. <laughs> um, I guess the question is how you detect uh, or I distinguish between proprietary trading or speculation and market making. Right? And you have a terrific analogy, I think, in the book where you compare speculation uh, to uh, second-hand car, second car salesman, which is 
possibly something that well, the second that wasn't part... meant as a pejorative. No, I understand. Uh, of course. Well, I so... thought this whole idea from Bill Shelby. Yeah, when yeah, I know. He said, why don't you get rid of this proprietary trade? <laughs> Well, actually, absolutely. he came to me and said, you know, <laughs> we, we, so I have this proprietary trading, I want to get rid of proprietary trading. I said, well, why do you want to do that? <laughs> I mean, why do you want to do it? And why don't we just increase the capital of banks? Mm. And that's a, that, that, the, I mean, Larry Summers, who's a smart economist, says just raise capital high enough. And I'll tell you that if I believed that you could raise capital of banks high enough and they couldn't circumvent those regulations, then that's enough. But we've seen it time and again. If you give them an opportunity and you give them capital requirements, they set up separate subsidiaries and so on and so forth, and they erode capital requirements. So in that sense, you want to have another dimension. The other dimension might be to suppress whatever extra risks you can. The only input that I had in this process was that the claim that you can't tell the difference between proprietary trading and, and, uh, and market making, that's just not true. You can. Every manager of every trading desk at every bank and in every investment bank does that for a living. <laughs> every manager of every trading desk sits there and says, hey, you, down at the end over there, why are you holding that, that security for the past week or two? <laughs> what do you think he's asking him? You're holding it because you're speculating. Get rid of it. That's their job. Can they do it 100%? Absolutely not. Nothing is 100%. Nothing is 100%. But if you, if you force bank management to say <clears throat> the CEO of the, finan of the bank is going to have to testify that there's no financial institution, uh, that there are no speculation, otherwise he's going to spend 10 years in jail, I guarantee you there won't be any speculation. <laughs> I guarantee it. Now, obviously, I'm not proposing that. Don't write that. Okay? <laughs> I didn't say that. I said you can tell. And you can make it happen if you really want to. Do you really want to? Well, so far, it's the law of the land. And there is a role given the imperfection in capital requirements. Capital requirements can be circumvented, and they have been. Well, you have the same problem with capital requirements. How did I do that? Was that OK? No, that was very good, actually. <laughs> you, you've done a terrific job, I've learned from. But a capital requirement, you know, you want to use a capital requirement to deal with proprietary trading, you still have to define proprietary trading. Right, right. So it doesn't that's, avoid the problem. True. And you really to have an effect. When the banker says, yeah, do it by capital requirements, he's thinking in his mind, let's we'll jack them up by 1%. If you really want to do it, you jack them up by 20%. Yes, <laughs> I, and we'll now move to the question from the others. But I want to stress this because it's a topical issue. And this argument that you cannot tell, you hear, you can't tell between proprietary trading and market making, you hear a lot. It's a key argument of the opponents of the Volcker rule. I, I recommend for anyone who's interested in this re, to read, that, if nothing else, that part of the book because it explains it and lays out very clearly all my article on that, which is also clear about that. But, <laughs> so, which They're in the a, same thing. It's the same, the same thing. thing. I, I quoted you verbatim. <laughs> um, but let, let's ask. Uh, um, Let's, let's hear from the others. There's some good questions here. I'll start from this because it's reasonably uh, provocative. So, in, in this election season, we heard that Ron Paul, friend of the Fed, uh, talking about bringing the gold standard back. <coughs> Your thoughts? No. No. <laughs> I don't think that's you know, on anybody's real agenda, or maybe on Ron Paul's agenda. Who kind of, I mean, much to my surprise, Ron Paul and I get along personally okay. I don't see him very well. I have a letter in a book which says right? he thinks you're the height of integrity. <laughs> but I, you know, let me. I wrote a kind of essay about gold and a, a preface to a book about gold, which I recommend by, by Peter Bernstein. It's a terrific book that yes, came out a few years ago, and a new edition has come out with a new introduction. <laughs> but the, the point I make there, he goes through all the complicated gold uh, standard history. If the gold standard is going to be effective, you've got to fix the price for gold, and you've got to really stick to it mm -hmm. through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. 
And who thinks that after we went off gold a couple of times in the last century or so, somebody is really going to stick through thick and thin. As soon as you get in trouble, you go off. And that, then the gold standard is, means nothing. To get on the gold standard technically now, an old-fashioned gold standard, and you had to replace all the dollars out there in foreign hands with gold. God, the price, you buy gold because the price of gold would have to be enormous. <laughs> and who thinks that would be maintained? Yeah. Um, there's a question from, I think, both of you, uh, which says, do you believe that large-scale asset purchases are effective? And you saw through what channel? This, what? The, the, it's just a question about the, the quantitative easing. So they're yeah, asking yeah, whether sure. large-scale asset purchases are effective. And, and you saw through what channel, meaning, I think, which assets do you buy to make a, yeah, to no, make a okay. dent? I can't comment on that any more than I have. I'm not there. But uh, as I said, I, the successive efforts to QE1, QE2, some of this stuff is not new stuff. This twist business we did back in the 60s, not very effectively. Uh, but I, I think these are you know, kind of extreme measures because the straightforward central banking measures have lost their effectiveness. They're going as far as they can go. And you can have a difference of opinion on how effective these last actions are, but nobody thinks they're going to be... <laughs> There's nothing magic in those actions that's going to, in my view, produce a dramatic difference. Did you have a Did they help at the margin? I don't know. I think QE2 should have stayed as the name of a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, I... Look, we talk about QE2, QE3. They're nothing more than open market operations. Mm -hmm. They're nothing more than open market operations, which have been around for the longest time. They go out and they buy government securities. They buy mortgage securities. Now the focus is not so much on the open market purchases, which add reserves to banks that allow them to lend out, it's more on, oh, if they're going to buy mortgage-backed securities, they're going to push up the price and directly lower the interest rate. Well, that's fine. Do you think the problem today is that interest rates are too high? <laughs> I don't think that's the problem today. I think the problem today is we've had 20 years of excessive leverage. That's what brought the financial crisis. Leverage, leverage, leverage. Leverage kills, like speed kills, if the prices go in the wrong direction. You're not going to be able to fix up the legacy of excess leverage and the reticence that people have about spending because of that by lowering the interest rates from 1.7% to 1.5%. It's a process that has to take time. And what I'm afraid is that you keep on p pushing out QE2, QE3, and QE4, you're leaving a huge puddle of liquidity out there that's going to have to be pulled back at a time when nobody's ready to pull it back. So I think it's counterproductive. What, what they're banking on is that the stimulus to some assets, like stock prices or otherwise, or house prices, will be a kind of mechanism for getting mm -hmm. the economy going. But the risk is you promote some speculative activity without doing much for the real economy, which might only complicate your problems down the road. So it's a tricky business. There's a question about the, uh, I guess we call it the too big to fail problem, right? So this says, in the past, the US has occasionally bailed out big intermediaries. No. You did one. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, most recently, uh, it, most recently, everybody else other than Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, right? Um, at other times, it's let them fail. Under what circumstances do bailouts make sense? Well, let, let me talk a bit too big to fail or what to do about it, because this is a more important issue than even than the Volcker rule. So I mean, now we're getting to the heart of the thing. Mm -hmm. This feeling that large financial institutions are protected because they feel protected, they take bigger risks than they would otherwise take. And there's no doubt that they were protected on a grand scale during the crisis. And even stockholders were being protected. Nobody, in many cases, very few cases, where stockholders wiped out, which you think might happen when you had a failure. So this is a, a big problem that everybody's concerned about. And what do you do about it? And there hasn't been enough attention on this front, I think. Uh, Dodd-Frank bill has a section that says 
in the future, no failing significant financial institution will be saved in the sense of the management and the stockholders remaining or the creditors, particularly non-secure creditors, will not be put at risk. And you say, well, that's nice to say. But how are they going to do that? Well, they, in effect, provide an override from normal bankruptcy law. And they said the, the government, in this case, yes, FDIC, which they already do for small banks, can step in. They will, if they want, provide enough financing to keep the institution going and meeting immediate uh, requirements. On the financial side, but the management's gone, the stockholders are gone, whether the creditors get any money depends upon the final disposition, but that institution will be liquidated. Now, by liquidated, it might be, in fact, liquidating over time, or selling it off as a whole, or more likely in pieces. And there are collateral approaches to make, it, make that more practical. Now, when you explain that, everybody says, that's fine, but it's not going to work in practice. Mm. And, you know, whether it'll work in practice or not needs to be tested. But it won't be working in practice very well, for one thing, unless there is agreement internationally. Because if you're dealing with a big international bank, and let's say it's an American bank, you cannot deal with that thing smoothly just in the United States. And the really critical thing, the other big financial market, international financial market, is, of course, London. And you better get agreement between London and New York, or so between the United States and the UK, about how to handle this. And it's remarkable. It's not generally known, but I got a, I'm sitting on some committee where I hear about it. There is a lot of technical discussion going on to get consistency between the UK yeah. and the United States. I'm not sure it's in UK law yet, but they're going to put it in law. And now this latest report in the continent of Europe, they have the same thing. They've got to provide, recommend a resol so-called resolution authority so you can get some consistency around the world. And I happen to think that it will work. It'll certainly work for a non-bank. Whether it works for the biggest banks in the world, well, the first money is going to be they're not going to fail in the first place. Right. They get better regulated. And they're so diverse and so big, I think there's a good chance be a long while before we're faced with the, with the imminent failure of the four largest banks in the world, or the yes, sir, six sir. largest banks in the yes, world. Uh, but I think theoretically it will even work then if we get a little practice. Mm. Uh, but it would have worked for Bear Stearns, it would have worked for Lehman, it would have worked for uh, AIG. I have no doubt in my mind that if that had been in the law and in the practice, you could have handled it. Mm -hmm. Bill, what do you, what's your thought? What are your thoughts? On this TV? problem is beyond my, my, my pay grade. This is, a, this is a really big problem, how we deal with the too-big-to-fail problem. And the man on my right, in fact, did deal with the too-big-to-fail problem in the case of Continental Illinois. Sure. And that was bailed out. That, by the way, was not the first too-big-to-fail problem. The too-big-to-fail problem occurred before that. There was Chrysler loans and there was Lockheed loans. And I argue in 1914, Treasury Secretary McAdoo bailed out New York City because they couldn't pay their loans. So this, is an, this is, goes back a long time, too-big-to-fail. And I think you've got to get this resolution authority so that institutions that fail, in fact, we can separate out the, cr the key, the key uh, functions. This is something that is really easy to say and hard to do. <laughs> so I don't have a solution, and I'm glad that he's on the committee and not me. <laughs> um, we have a question on, on Europe. Um, do you agree, and it's to you both, do you agree with Angela Merkel's insistence on austerity for Greece, Spain, and Italy? Well, I mean, yeah. Austerity, yes. That leaves you with a definition of how much austerity <laughs> you She wants a lot. But there's no, there's no way you can deal with that problem without uh, a substantial degree of austerity in cases where there have been big excesses of debt and indebtedness and, and bubbles in various parts of the economy and inefficiencies. And you can't sustainably 
bail them out without a, basically, a quid pro quo. On the other hand, let me say, they, you can't expect them to maintain austerity unless they get some assurance they're going to get bailed out, to use that word, that they will, they will be financed over an indefinite period. And this is where the kind of the rubber hits the road. Everybody, I think, understands that you need, let's not call it austerity, but you need very disciplined policies by the borrower. You need a willingness to lend them part of the creditors. The creditors don't quite trust the borrowers, and the borrowers don't quite trust the creditors that they will provide the money. So they don't do this on a grand scale. They do it for, it comes to a kind of clinch, and they do it for three months. You say, well, go ahead for another three months, and they don't say three months, but yeah. they announce yeah. it three months. Yeah. And then a few months later, they come to another lock you to the road, so they a yeah. yeah. little more discipline, a little more money. And the central bank is, the European Central Bank has uh, kind of swallowed hard and said, we'll provide the money mm. when push comes to shove. A much more interesting thing than what the Federal Reserve's doing in the... <laughs> Behind all this, I believe there is kind of an enormous sense of commitment in Europe, partly for political reasons to maintain the euro, but partly on the just in the, on the part of the general public. I mean, they almost, after 10 years, can't imagine. I can't, can you imagine going back to the drachma? What does that mean? <laughs> and what would happen to the drachma under this situation? And nobody thinks that would be a very happy story. So there is a kind of story, I think, understandable and, and right, conviction that we're going to try our best to hold this thing together. Yeah. But what about this argument that if you impose German-style austerity on those countries right now, you effectively kick them while they're down? You exacerbate the economic dire straits that they find themselves in? Look, austerity is something that, uh, you know, it's easy, easy for the other guy to do. So, I, I mean, I understand that. But the problem in the European Union is that there's only one, only one dimension of union, and that is monetary union mm -hmm. as opposed to fiscal union. Yeah. And I think what's happened in Greece and Spain is that they, were, they benefited from low interest rates because of the, the union, and that meant that they allowed their fiscal policies to get out of line. So it's sort of just the reverse of the problem that we have here, that we had here, which was, okay, we can raise rates and cut them back. Here, rates came down, and oh, now we can spend. So the discipline that would naturally occur disappeared when you had the union. I thought you were gonna make a different point. I, I agree with this, you know, Greece and Spain and so forth could, could borrow a German interest mm -hmm. rates, and they went kind of wild. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the good old United States of America. We ran, Historically, big deficits. We consumed without saving. And how is this all possible? We invested all this in, in housing because the Chinese were happily lending us money at very low interest rates. It was the same. Substitute the word United States for Greece and China for Germany, and you have on a world scale a problem in the United States, a problem in the, in the whole world. Uh, uh, let me just, following Bill's comment, you know, you've got an existential moment for the euro, or one the moment, but an existential period. And they are in the midst of deciding do they want more unity or less? Because the euro cannot survive unless they have more sense of some kind of central control, more sense of discipline before the crisis than they've had, which means some kind of limits on fiscal policy for one thing. But it goes beyond fiscal policy. You get in trouble. Uh, Spain had a pretty good fiscal policy, and they managed to get in big trouble by borrowing a lot of money to build houses. So you've got to have some kind of oversight of economic policy more generally as part of the price of being in the union. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they wanted to make a union on the cheap. We'll have a union, a monetary union, without the economic union. 
doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the proposals are out there, and I think they basically want to move toward more, <laughs> more economic union, because to do that, that takes a change in the treaty. Oh, yeah. And a lot of debate, you know, going to be a lot of reluctance. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to do it in the end, but you know, this is something you can't do overnight. Mm -hmm. But the fact they're willing to look at that is absolutely crucially important in living through this period of real upset and concern. Part of the reason that China lends to us and the rest of the world lends to us is that historically we've shown fiscal discipline. So, you know, as soon as we waver, that's when the problem will emerge. Uh, so I just come back and say, you need to make sure that we have long-term fiscal discipline. Otherwise, at some point, the Chinese are going to say, what are we holding these green pieces of paper for? Well, it doesn't look green because it's, uh, you know, electronic. But still, what are we holding them for? And I think we are still benefiting from the 1980s and the 1990s when we showed monetary discipline and fiscal discipline. That is not a bank that you can continue to go to without fiscal discipline. I forget the figures, but a very large fraction of the total public debt of the United States is held by foreigners. Oh, yeah. And that isn't, <laughs> you know, shouldn't be the most comfortable feeling in the world. Um, before we leave the subject, I want to, it's not on the cards, I want to ask you a quick yes or no question. In hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, was the euro a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think it was a good thing, but I, I, I'm in a minority of <laughs> economists. Good or bad? If it was Sing. the first step towards further integration, it was a good thing. Okay. Uh, we have a question on this which is also uh, related to the very poignant last chapter, the trust chapter, um, which is, what is the biggest danger faced by the United States? And what happens if we lose the trust that you outlined in the, in the last chapter? What is happens to the dollar? Well, to both of you. What happens to the dollar? What happens to the US economy? What happens to the debt? Well, look, the biggest threat in the United States, you want me to get on my, over there and give you a sermon or something. <laughs> We've got a country that is deeply divided. It's got big ideological differences. It's been unable to get together on some cohesive policies and some reasonable understanding in so many issues, including economic policy. And then, you know, no, I won't get entirely up to the soapbox, maybe I'll stop, but uh, unless this election has some, I'm not thinking about who wins, unless this has some effect in kind of waking up the country and saying we've got to move together, we've got to deal with the most obvious things, we've got to deal with this enormous budget deficit mm -hmm. over a period of time, that that's going to take something to do about the so-called entitlements. Some of them are relatively easy, some are very hard, like Social Security. And we've got to face the revenue problem that we clearly have, and we've got to face those two problems and many others and get together within the next six months or eight months to demonstrate that we can do it because the uh, avenues we've been getting on don't give any confidence to anybody, including me. And that's a sad story. And how do you expect mm -hmm. other people to... The big respond? surprise to me, again, in writing this book, is the fact that you can't have responsible monetary policy without fiscal integrity. And I think the record shows that we benefited a lot in the United States for showing fiscal integrity. We are really at a point where if we do not show it, I think that we are in serious danger of losing the status of a safe haven currency. We have a safe haven currency. The world looks to the United States because it trusts us not to debase the currency and to remain fiscally responsible. Uh, by the way, we are the only country in the world, I think aside from Denmark, that has a debt ceiling. The only country in the world, no other country has a debt ceiling, they just sell debt. So there is like a, there's like a speed bump 
The speed bump is Congress has to authorize an increase in the debt ceiling. And by the way, that's what happened. The Graham Rudman, I hate to bring up Graham Rudman Hollings, you heard enough about it, right? <laughs> so Graham Rudman Hollings was passed as an amendment to a debt ceiling bill. <laughs> Otherwise, it would never have passed. So there is, there is there's room here, but I think Congress has to get serious. And it's going to be very difficult for them to get serious when interest rates are 1.7% and they look low for a long period of time. And that worries me. And just to be clear, you, you think we are close to that tipping point. You think you're close to the point where the trust in the dollar as a safe haven currency is about to be lost? No, no, I, I didn't say trust. I mean, I mean do I think it's going to happen? It, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It, does, it rarely happens instantaneously. It's very hard to dislodge the medium of exchange. People keep on using it because it's so convenient. So we do have some time. Mm. But at some point, if we lose that status, then I think we are in danger. Is that going to happen tomorrow? No. Could it happen within the next 18 months to two years? Yeah. No, the, the sad part of this is the strength of the dollar is partly a reflection of how bad the other currencies look. <laughs> and that's not uh, yeah. The so safest true. way you right. want to look at this. Yeah. Um, we're coming to the end, but maybe we, we conclude on a slightly more upbeat note. The, um, the question is, what is the United States' biggest economic asset? And how can we exploit it to drive growth? United States, what do you want me to do? Get up on the... United our, it's our people, yeah. you know. Is that right? <laughs> Innovation. <laughs> I thought it was a press. Well, right? I can give that speech too. But, uh, and our free economic system and all of it. <laughs> no. uh, you know, the there United must be States one. is blessed with obviously enormous resources, enormous uh, diversity. I think our diversity is extremely important. Uh, our openness to immigration, which is in mm -hmm. some <laughs> question. Of, uh, we have so many serious. Uh, ideological conflicts that affect the budget maybe indirectly or sometimes directly that uh, to give some pause. We've always been able to reconcile these differences in approach and now we're head on in the question of needing to reconcile them. I'm going to be very specific about this as opposed to, and I believe in all these other things that our, our willingness and openness and so on. The most important resource unexploited is natural gas. Mm -hmm. We have more natural gas than the rest of the world has oil reserves. If we can't build a car to run on natural gas, it's called natural gas, right? So you should be able to run a car on it. We can put a man on the moon. I would bet that we could, we could run cars are natural gas. And if we have those kind of resources, that's an unexploited resource that can change the dynamic, not, a, not just of the domestic economy, but the balance of political power in the world. That may be very important, but I hate to think the United States, this great country, rests upon well, fracking natural gas. <laughs> You covered all the good stuff. <laughs> You're not convinced. Well, I think it's a good thing, but I... <laughs> he covered everything. I hope well, he has some like strength for me to say. Uh, Andrew, I guess it's a pretty good one. Uh, we have a very quick one, maybe, um, and uh, this one, I, I, get, I bet we get a no comment, couple of no comments, but it is a question. Where are you putting your money right now? <laughs> Why do you think I'm here at the study school? <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a story. This, <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this story right from this location. But I said something about where you invest your money. Stern School, a great business school, has mature students by and large. Many of them have been on Wall Street. You know, these guys are not neophytes. I was teaching here a little bit. I mean, a little occasionally would appear at a class, and I was at this class, 
1999. Uh, no, I don't know, 100 people in this class or something, you know, getting toward the end of the, it's at the end of the semester, and it's getting to, you know, how, what the hell do I do? The bell hasn't <laughs> rung yet. Huh? So, uh, I'll ask him a couple of questions. I asked him to, a question. I said, how many people do you think that the stock market will, in preliminary, there's a stock market going up at an annual rate of 15% for 15 years in 1990. How many of you here think the stock market in the next 10 years will go up by, I thought I'd give an impossible hurdle, right? By 10% a year. Every hand went up. <laughs> Every hand in the room. Now, of course, it took until now for the stock market to get back to where it was. And, you know, how long can one be when they get caught up in these periods? Everybody's expectation depends upon what happened in the last 10 years. And I, a couple of them come in. We didn't, you know, I expressed some sort of, we didn't say it was going to go up 10% every year. We know there'll be some ups and downs. So, yes, in 10 years it will go up 10 10% a year. So that's my answer to your uh, question. Good. I'm not sure I'm going to find the answer to your question here, however much I respect <laughs> the, the Stern School, but if you have it, please whisper it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a confession. Six months ago, I bought some gold. I did. First time ever. Six months ago, I bought some gold. It's 3% of my portfolio. This is real gold? I mean, gold... Yeah. Well, gold in a vault someplace. I'm not telling you where. So, 3%. I hope it goes to zero. Yeah. Oh, I, I hope it that. goes to zero. Mm. I worry if it starts to go to 50% of my portfolio. Mm. And you should worry, too. Well, on that note, that is, this is that's that's the Silver Gold Standard. Yeah. <laughs>